speak to you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was little, littler than I am now, when I was small in school, in public school, every Friday was my favorite day. Not because it was the last day of the week, and the weekend was approaching, but because on Friday afternoons, our teacher would read aloud to us so that all of us would sit, we would put our heads down on our desks, and she would read aloud to us from a book with a continuing story. And depending on how much time we had, she might just read one chapter or two chapters. It was sort of like those of you who are old enough to remember radio serials so that you like had to tune in again to hear the next, next installment. So every Friday we would hear a new chapter and the story would progress. And I can still remember some of the titles. She read the story called The Gauntlet, which was all about this little boy who uh, was rambling about the English countryside of having to find an old gauntlet. When he put it on, it took him back in time. He was back in many old times and he had to figure things out as a young boy in the castle. There was another one called Cue for Treason, which was which took place, I don't know why these books took place in England, I guess in Canada in the 50s and 60s, we didn't have a lot of Canadian literature. And it was about, also about a young boy who somehow gets swept up at the court of the Tudors in some kind of um, uh, plot, and he is a young boy who sort of saves the day. And it was the best time of the week for me, it was the most exciting thing in the week. I loved listening to her, and as she read, she gave all the characters voices, and she emphasized the exciting parts. It was a magical, magical time, and really, as I think of it, I'm sure it's what inspired me in my absolute love for history. To this day, I'm a deep history buff, and I read his history, and I'm sure it is what inspired and encouraged me to be interested, and to this day, I'm a voracious reader. And I'm um, always at the library. I always have lots of books piled all over the house. It wasn't that we didn't know how to read. It was just that it was such a joy to have someone read to us. People of Israel who are being read to today in this piece from Nehemiah do not know how to read. So their sacred book is being read to them. Not only do they not know how to read, they have no clue what Ezra is saying to them. Because Ezra is a scribe, a Levite. He's from the educated class, and he speaks Hebrew. The exiles and the remnants who stay behind, all those who have now come together to celebrate the rebuilt temple, the end of their exile, their return from Babylon, do not understand Hebrew. They speak Aramaic, which is kind of slang. They have no idea what Ezra is reading them. And so standing beside Ezra, as we see in his reading, as he read to them, someone interpreted for him so that they could understand. They did not only did not know their language, they didn't know their faith, they didn't know the Torah, they didn't know their religious laws, customs, requirements, fasts, feasts. They knew nothing of their faith. They had been exiled in Babylon for hundreds and hundreds of years. They had now come home to a ruined Jerusalem, a city in ruins, where the temple had to be rebuilt at night because they were afraid still that the Samaritans in the north would come down and destroy the rebuilt city. So they stood for hours, and as so beautifully read by Teresa, some of them cried because it was the first time they had heard anything about the faith. A faith they had only heard little bits about from maybe their grandparents or their older, older, older parents who had survived the transport. So they didn't even know their own faith. It had to be read out to them. And by the time Jesus stands up to read in the temple in our gospel reading, most people then still could not read it right. It's a very, very tiny group of people, which is why they were scribes at the temple. If you needed something read, if you needed something written, you went to the temple and a scribe who you had to pay would write the letter for you, would read the letter to you, would instruct you in what had been said, and tell you what to do next. 
So Jesus stood up and read. Most of those there would not have known how to read. But they knew what he was reading because it was the custom that anyone could lead worship in the synagogue. An invitation I extend to all of you this morning. <laughs> anyone. There were no priests, there were no ministers, there were no deacons or archdeacons. Anyone with sufficient learning and the ability to read could lead worship. They started with the Shema. The Lord is your God. There's only one God. There's no other God before him. They had a set prayer. And then they could choose any reading they wanted to and read the prophets. Usually from the prophets. And then expound upon them. So Jesus stood up. The synagogue attendant handed him a scroll. And he read from the part of Isaiah. A reading they would know. He was a prophet. They would recognize. But Jesus said something totally shocking to these people. And we don't see the end part of the story, which, as you recall, they end up kicking them out of town. He says to them, this story is fulfilled in me. I am the story. Not only did they not understand that they were offended, because they thought, who is this carpenter's son? Who is this guy that's grown up in our neighborhood? Who does he think he is? Telling us that he is the scripture. But Jesus knew he was the scripture. Jesus knew he was the word made flesh. He was the word of God. Twelve centuries later, St. Francis of Assisi says, For me, the crucifix is the Bible. For me, the crucifix is the scripture. For me, the crucifix is the word. So an object that he gazed upon was the story for him. He didn't need any words. The object told him the whole story. So now here are we. And like the same people Ezra read to, 400 years B.C., we live in a community that mostly doesn't have faith. Mostly doesn't know it's faith. Mostly knows nothing about faith. Maybe has never been inside a church ever. Passes them by, thinks they're nice buildings, gets very upset if they close down their community. But many people, the majority of the people now in our society, never been in church, or temple, or synagogue, and don't know what happened. So for them, you and I are the story. You and I are the interpreters of the story. Because when they see you, and you identify as I worship at St. John's. I'm a Christian. I believe in God. That is the only encounter with the salvation story that they may ever have. And what will they know? What will they know about the faith from you? From you as the story, from you as the word? Will they know excitement, interest, energy? Surprise, adoration? Or will they know indifference? Coolness? Maybe fake news rather than good news. As Jesus said to the assembled company, the Lord has appointed me. The Lord has appointed you in your baptism to bring good news those who sit in darkness, to the oppressed, to the disappointed, to the disillusioned, to the uncertain, to the afraid, to the angry, to the vengeful, to the lonely, to the estranged. We are the story. We are the interpreters of the story. 
What will people know about the story from us? In one of my favorite movies is a classic line. This British detective is investigating a gangland slave. And he's interviewing witnesses. And two of the witnesses characterize one of their friends. And he says to them, wait, wait. That might not be true. You can't tell a book by its cover. And they look at him and say, you have to if you can't read. We're the cover of the book. We are the book. We are the word of God to those who can't or haven't read the story. <coughs> we are appointed to bring good news to the captives, to set the oppressed free, to bring light and sight to those who are blind. What will they know from the story we tell?